Hallelujah. If you just grab the hand of your neighbor this morning, let's agree and pray for the release. The release of the power and presence of God to flow freely in this atmosphere. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we honor you. We give you glory. We thank you, Lord, for being a merciful, kind God. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in the house of the Lord this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you have a plan and purpose in mind. That, God, we're not here by accident, but, God, you have a purpose for us being in your house today, God. So, Lord, we agree now that every hindrance, every stumbling block, every distraction in our minds, every spirit of strife, every spirit of witchcraft, every spirit of rebellion will come under subjection now to the power and presence of God. And we re agree now for the release of the glory and presence of God Hakahaya in this atmosphere. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and we command every plotted scheme of the enemy to be destroyed right now in the name of Jesus, that the word of the Lord could come forth and power God in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do in the house of God today. For you have a mind and a plan to set your people free today. And we thank you and we give your name the praise, God, and the honor and the glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, we th thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. Come on, give the Lord some praise in the house. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You can have your seat this morning. Uh, it's truly an honor and a privilege to be standing before you this morning. And I want to give honor to my awesome apostle and pastor this morning, Apostle Heron and Pastor Wanda. They are my spiritual parents, truly the only ones I have ever had. So if you've been here for 20 some years, you know that. But if you've been here recently, I have only been a member of this church and I am 36. This is the only church I have been in. And you wanna know why that is? Because the vision and the plan that God has given this house is from the Lord. And anything from the Lord has a sustaining power because it comes with the grace, undergirding, and supply from the Lord. So that is why a house of God and a vision of God can stand for 30, 40, 60, 80, 100 years, two generations, 200 years. Why? Because it's not man's plan. It's God's plan. And God's plan in the earth is not controlled by man. It's controlled by God. It's by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So I just want to give honor to you guys. Happy anniversary. Happy birthday, Pastor Wanda. I heard you turn 29. Praise the Lord. That's at least that's what I say now every time I turn a year older. Turn 29. Again? Yeah, again, yeah. But God bless you all. It's truly an honor to speak on such an occasion this morning. And I, I, I believe the Lord gave me something this morning. I really want you to listen carefully and open your heart this morning. The Lord's been dealing with me about this all week long. All week long. And uh, it has to do with the vision. The vision. The vision is what? Healing and restoration, that's the vision, right? So if you in this house, the vision is healing and restoration. And that ain't going to change. So I understand that sometimes you don't like it. It steps on your toes. It makes you uncomfortable, that type of thing. But the vision of this house is healing and restoration. 
And if you're sitting here in a pew, then God has healing for you. If you didn't need anything, you didn't need any restoration. If you didn't need any deliverance, you wouldn't be in this house. But if God sets you in this house, then that means you need some healing and restoration. So let's just be okay with the vision. Hallelujah. Let's just be okay with it. So the Lord gave me this title. Now, this is a broad title. And really, I'm not going to be able to dive way into all of these aspects of it. But he said, healing from the mistreatment or abuse of authority figures. And I, I said, Lord, I have never, ever gotten a title like this. I said, is it me? Because, um, all right. That's what he said. He said, healing from the mistreatment or abuse of authority figures. And here's why this word is urgent. Ha Here is why it's urgent. Because some of us here are really unable to do the will and purpose of God and align yourself with the vision because of the issues in your childhood with those who were in authority over you and they mistreated you. And because it hasn't been dealt with, as an adult, I'm trying to serve the Lord. I'm trying to walk into the call and ministry that God has for me, and I'm unable to line up under leadership. And because I can't line up, I actually can't walk in the blessings of God that God intended for me. Because Christ said, I've come to give you life and more abundantly. So he already paid the price for the abundant life. The issue is in me. It's not Christ. Because the sin starts within my heart. And so if I'm walking contrary to his word, because I can only see people through the hurt that I receive, then I'm walking in sin. And if I'm practicing can't sin, I can't obtain the blessings of God. So this is why this is urgent, because I need the Lord needs you to be delivered so that he can use you to the uh, capacity that he intended for you. Hallelujah. See, he, he never intended you to you to, for you to cycle. Thank, thank you. You must do. I was going to knock them things over. He never intended for you to cycle. You're in one job one year, then the job the next year because you got mad with the boss. And then so-and-so was my best friend this year. Next year, I don't like him because he said something I didn't like. Or I come to church and pastor looked at me strange, and so I thought. And so now I'm going to go to another church because I didn't like what he said or she said. And all I'm doing through my life is cycling, cycling through churches, cycling through jobs, cycling through relationships. And God paid a price that was too great for me to cycle because the blood of Christ came for me to break the curse off of my life. And so if I'm not living in freedom, then I need to go to the Lord and say, God, where is my freedom? I know you died for it. I know you sent your son on the earth so that I can receive eternal life, so I can receive abundant life, and I'm not living it. So God, what is wrong? I'll do whatever I need to do. If I need to forgive, I'll forgive. If I need to turn the other cheek, then I'll do it. If I need to humble myself and come under, then I'll do it. But Lord, I just want to be free. Hallelujah. Glory to God. For some of us, we got to want it bad enough. See that? Oh, Lord Jesus. See, see, here's the thing. All right. The vision has already been established. Healing takes place every week. Sometimes twice a week, sometimes three times a week because he might have a deliverance service. Sometimes four times a week because he called you in for counseling. So you have all of these opportunities. So if I'm not free, why am I not free? Have you evaluated if have you evaluated if you've opened your heart and your spirit? Have you evaluated that? Because it's not that Christ is doing anything. It's not that he's holding his blessings from you. It's not that Christ has turned his back on you. It's me. I'm the factor that's common in every scenario. 
So why am I not free? Why am I not free? It's because I don't want it bad enough. If you look in the word, every person in the New Testament that really received something from the Lord, they did. They were desperate. They crawled on the floor. The, the, the lady said, I'll take the crumbs that you dropped on the ground. I know I'm not entitled to your blessing, but I'll take the crumbs. That's desperate. And they lifted the lame man up into the house to get delivered. Lifted him up into the now. If I'm lame and these people and these people all are around me, at some point in my own self, I say, well, I guess I can't get to them. Oh, well, that's what we have a tendency to do. Well, I prayed to the Lord one time and I didn't see nothing happen. So I guess Christ ain't on my side, just like my dad won't or just like my mom won't or just like other, all these other people won't. We are, we're not desperate enough. When you get desperate, you say, Lord, if I got to come every week to the altar, I'm going to get it. If I got to turn over my plate for five days, I'm going to get it. Whatever I need to do, if I need to get up two hours in the morning early so I get it, then I'm going to do it because I'm desperate for the Lord, because I must be free, because I understand that if I'm not free, then I'm not free from sin. And the whole goal of this life is to walk in holiness. Why? Because without holiness shall no man see the Lord. So I have to see it as important enough to say, God, I need some help because I understand if I don't get any help, I'm going to end up walking in sin because my vision is tainted. I can't walk straight when I'm crippled. I need help from the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, I know it sounds like I'm meddling. It's the Holy Spirit. I'm not yelling. I just, the Holy Spirit just wants to emphasize the importance. Because, see, the hour, the hour is coming nigh. It's, it's getting short. And, see, God is ready to do some things in the earth. But as we heard last week, he can't do anything in the earth unless a man makes himself available. And so if my, my tunnel that the funnel that comes through me is clogged with all of this junk, then he can't really manifest himself in the earth like he wants to. So if you're in this house, then there's a reason why you are here. You are here because God wants to do something in your heart. He wants to heal you and deliver you and set you free so the whole full true call and destiny of God can come forth. Hallelujah. The vision is not going away. This is the vision of the house. I don't know why I'm going this way. I can't get to my notes, but praise the Lord. The vision of this house is not going away. This is the vision. And every minister that's connected to the apostle and pastor, guess what they're going to preach? The vision. Because it is not man ordained. It's God ordained. So what you really need to do is say, Lord, I'm taking my eyes off the pastor and the apostle, and I'm saying, Lord, I choose to submit to the vision that you gave. And when I do that, it becomes a whole lot easier to sit here on Sunday and hear the message instead of saying, Lord, he talking about that again. Oh. I started to stay home. I should have stayed home today. Why, why are he praying for people again? I'm ready to go. I'm hungry. Y'all act like y'all don't say that. You don't, you don't got to tell me. All right. This is the vision of the house. Now, what God is about to do, what God is about to do, see, apostle, I don't know why I'm going. I'm this is not my notes. I'm just going to go with it. Apostle has labored with many of us for years. He will sit here and pray for you for 20 and 30 minutes till that breakthrough comes. But there's a shift that's occurring where the healing is going to be in the atmosphere. And if you open your heart to receive, you will. But there is no guarantee that 
it's going to he's going to come to you personally and say the lord wants to heal you and then wait for you 10 minutes to decide i guess i'm okay with that the manna is changing in the house it's changing in the house and so sometimes you're going to come in and before the first song is sung it's going to drop and when it does if you open up your heart you can be delivered but if you're waiting for him to preach at the end there may not be an altar call because he doesn't have and she doesn't have the ability to take 20 minutes with you when he sends the 200. You see what I'm saying? Because there are hearts out there that are hurting and they're waiting to get in the door. And the Lord has been merciful to try to prepare the house of God to receive the hurting people so don't we don't hurt them again. This place is a hospital. So you know how you came in 20 years ago and you were a mess? Guess what's about to come through the door? A mess. And they're going to need the same unconditional love that was given to you. But if you're not healed and delivered, all you're going to see is their face and you're going to send them out the door. Why? Because you don't want to deal with them. You don't want to labor with them. Oh, Lord, they're calling me again. Why are they calling me? Lord, help us. Because they need the same thing you got. But if you're not delivered, see, people have a way of bringing something out of us that's already in us. They know how to hit a nerve. Sometimes we think we deliver. I've done this myself. Oh, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. And someone walk up, and they, they say something to you, and a, a flip switch. And you're like, why am I fi- oh, Man, I'm ready to take them down. Why am I feeling like that? Because it was already in you. The Lord just sent them to show you, hey, you got a problem down here. It's like a check engine light. It most of the time comes on before you broke down. And if you ignore the light... What are you doing? You're calling AAA. You're looking stupid because you're like, I should have looked at the light. I saw the light and I just kept on driving. That's the same thing the Spirit does. Not everyone that comes into your life is of the devil. Some people are used to buffer you so that he can put character in you. But I don't know that if I don't go to the Lord and say, God, what is in me that's causing me to react like this? And if the Lord reveals it to me, then I know I need to humble myself and forgive and say, Lord, help me, not the person. Help me. The person may never change. The person may need you to be the light so that they can see Christ on the earth. But if I don't allow the Lord to change that thing that got triggered inside of me, they'll never see the light because guess what I'll do? I'll react just like the world. And after a certain point, I say, I'm not taking no more. I'm cussing and fussing. I'm telling the boss. I'm doing A, B, and C. I'm doing all the stuff looking exactly like the world did because I didn't let the Lord deal with what was inside of me. So it's critical now that we get this right. It's not that Christ is doing something wrong. He already gave his word. He already said it's the appointed time. He already said that he's uh, uh, that he, it is our season and it's our time. All of these words have been given. It is not God's fault. It is us. He's waiting on us to get our stuff in line so that when we get the blessing, we don't cut people with it. Or we don't become arrogant. Well, I got this now, so you know. Why you ain't got yours? You must be walking in sin, just like Job's friends. You know what they did that to him too. You must be walking in sin. We become too high-minded because we think we did something to deserve it. Hakatatea. We think we did something in our power to make it happen. And Christ is not going to share his glory with anybody else. So he rather protects you 
and hold you from it than to give it to you and you destroy yourself. Because that's what a loving God does. So it's better for me to say, God, what's in me that needs to be driven out so that I can be prepared? And you know what you'll find out? If you allow God to actually work that stuff out of you, the little material stuff you get will be like down here on the list. Because I understand the spiritual stuff is way up here. And you'll start to say, God, if I never get it, I don't even care no more. Why? Because I'd rather have you. I'd rather be pleasing to you. I'd rather be walking in holiness. If giving this to me means I'm not walking in holiness, I don't want it. That's the place God is trying to get you to. Because then if you get to that point, then he can bless you because he understands you're not going to turn your face once you get your car. Your priorities won't suddenly shift. You know them people, y'all you, see them people, they, they get a good, nice check in the mail. You know, first of all, people come out to woodworks. Oh, you got some money. You know what? I need, why don't you take us out to dinner? Oh, uh, uh, I need some help with uh, uh, this bill over here. And, uh, you know, the people come out to woodworks, right? But here's what also happens. You come out to woodworks. Because suddenly you're like, I don't know why Johnny's standing on the corner. He ought to go get a job. Wow, how arrogant. You don't know their situation. You start thinking better. Oh, I could get that if I wanted to. Oh, look at, th look at this house. I could get that if I wanted to. You start thinking too much of yourself. Arrogance. And if we, don't, we, be, if we get in that vein, if Christ was to show up and say, hey, I want you to go to church today. Because, uh, you know, I want you to hear the word. And your response is, man, I'm driving down here to Florida. I got the money anyway. I'm going to hang out. Oh, so your money took precedence over God's will? Mm, that's interesting. <laughs> this is why. This is why it is so important for us to hear the word and respond. You don't know what's in you. I don't know what's in me. Now, I don't know, like I said, I don't know why I'm going this way. Now, I remember, and I'm going to share this. I, I haven't told too many people this one. When I was 18 years old here, okay, and I was starting to kind of flow in the prophetic a little bit, you know, some things would happen. I had multiple people come to me and said, you just need to go ahead and pass it. I mean, the anointing is on you. You just need to go ahead on and start a church. I'm not talking about one. I'm not talking about two. I'm not talking about three people. I'm not talking about four people. I'm not talking about five people. Multiple people. And it was a span of a few years. And you know what I eventually told them? Because at first I was like, whoa, why are you, why are you telling me this? I, this is strange. You know what I told them? I said, you know what? With all due respect. I'd rather sit behind the piano for another 40 years if I ain't ready. And they said, they looked at me like, what are you talking about? I said, you don't understand the weight of the call that comes with flowing in a call. You don't understand the spiritual aspect that you must endure. If you hop out there before you're ready, because I knew I wasn't ready. I won't try to go in the way either, but. I knew I wasn't ready. You hop out there before you're ready. The enemy's sitting around the corner like, look at this one over here. He think he good. He floated under the anointing. But he don't have no stamina. He don't have no endurance yet. He doesn't know how to endure the hardness like a good shoulder. So I'm going to just send this little test and he'll be out. Bye-bye. The enemy is waiting to make you a spectacle to the world. Which is why it's important, one, to be delivered, and two, to be sent out at the appropriate time. Because there's a calling and there's a process. And if, see, see, this is what's happened in the world. This is what happened, okay? Somebody gets saved, and in the first year, the Lord reveals to them, Hey, you're called to be a pastor. Oh, well, look, I know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. There's excitement. 
and then in a year they're pastoring. Where was the process? Where was the process? You're over people's souls. It's not a mere matter. It's not something you take lightly. You're over people's souls. There's a calling and then there's a process. The process is important because if I go through the process, when I get into the full fruition of the call, I can be sustained by the grace of God. The grace of God is obtained over time. The grace is implanted into you when the call is made, but then the grace, the seed of grace must grow. And it only grows through time. One small assignment and I obey it. Then I do the next assignment and I obey it. And it may not be behind a pulpit. It may be with your coworker. Not everyone who prophesies up here prophesied the first time up here. Sometimes the Lord gave them an assignment and they prayed for them and they obtained wisdom from the Lord. And it turned into a prophecy. And then you build. The Lord builds and he trains you to eventually obtain the full fruition of the call. So if I'm called, that is great. But if I don't endure the process, I'll never come into the full fruition of the call. Because Christ knows what's in us. We don't know what's in us. Which is why we need deliverance. We need to remember the process. Some of us are frustrated because you say, well, I know I've been called to this. And I'm sitting here doing nothing. Why are you doing nothing? What is he telling you to do in this season? It might be to scrub some toilets. Why are you doing nothing? I understand you called to preach, but why aren't you functioning in some, uh, some organization in the church? Because the call always start with serving. What has the Lord asked you to do and you thought it was too small? What did he ask you to do that you thought was down here below, is beneath me? Because that's where your training is. So if I choose not to follow... What God has asked me to do, I never get the training, which means I never get to the call. It is not their fault. It is not God's fault. It is our fault for not doing what God asked. Now, I understand I tried to preach, but I'm also a prophet. I can't help it. I'm sorry. This is who I am. This is what God called me to be, and I have to flow in it. So Christ wants us to stop looking at all the stuff that I want to do, and I'm called to this. He never called me to speak. He never called me to preach. I don't get to do anything and ask the Lord, what am I to start at? It's called service. Jesus served before he was exalted. You need a scripture? I, the whole New Testament. Go look at it. Jesus served before he was exalted. He washed people's feet. The lowest thing you could do. 
and he was the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He took time to minister to one person. Multiple times. He went to people's houses to heal one child. He was the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he lowered himself enough to serve others. So guess what? If we're made in the image and likeness of God, and I'm following Christ, where do you think I'm going to start? By serving. I'm serving other people. I'm serving in the house of of God. I have attached myself to the committee that I need to be attached to. And I'm allowing God to grow the seed of grace in me so that I can obtain the destiny that he called me to. That is the process. And in the process, when the Lord says, you need healing, I, you need to forgive Guess what I'm doing? Lord, whatever you want, I open myself fully to it so that I can walk in the way that is pleasing in your sight. And as I continue to obey the Lord, then I run into my destiny. I won't have to work for it. It will come to me. I don't have to tell people that I'm called because they'll see the anointing on your life and it will speak for itself. You won't have to wear your title because you are it. People don't have to ask who you are. They'll know because the anointing is on your life and it's a bit, you've, been, you've been allowed to be processed so that when you walk into a room, there's no questions. See, Christ is not willing to put us out into the capacity where my character will destroy me. So I can see that I'm anointed and God is using me, but if he doesn't put me on display, that means there's something in me that could get my character out of whack, and now I have lost my light before all of those I just ministered to. It is critical. We got too many people looking at the church side eye right now because we look right crazy. We're not looking like Christ. And Christ is not going to make this house the same because he already said he wanted to make it an example, a lighthouse to the world. So I understand you've been here 20 years, but, I, but ask the Lord, why am I here? Whatever it is, Lord, I give it up. I choose to allow you to heal me from the stuff that's deep down that I don't want to deal with so that when I get out there, it doesn't pop up like a fox and destroy me. We got to want it more than the glamour and the call to be said, I'm a pastor, I'm a minister, I'm a prophet. The closer, look, here's what I have figured out in my life the last two years. The closer I get to the Lord, the more I realize how much help I really need. And I could look at people's side if I want, but I ain't got time. Because I got to stay before the Lord like, am I walking in grace? Because I know it only takes two seconds for me not to be. Because this flesh is wicked. And it will fly up. And if I don't have my defenses ready to push it back down and say, no, you're going to obey the word, it don't matter how long I've been walking with the Lord. I can get caught up in a snag. So the closer I get to the Lord, I've come to understand how much I need the Lord. I don't have time to look at you. I got to be at the altar myself. I got to make sure that I'm walking in a, in a way that's pleasing unto the Lord. I got to make sure I'm walking in the grace of God. I don't have time to look at you. So you need a solution? Get close to the Lord. And the closer you get, 
the more you read his word, the more you spend time in prayer, you realize, you know, I ain't got time to worry about Susie and my mama or whoever else. I got to get this right. So that no matter how they respond to me, I respond correctly. That don't come overnight. That's called time with God. Time. Time. I know nobody wants to wait. Time with God. It's the process so that I'm prepared for the destiny. Hallelujah. Glory. Let's give the Lord some praise in the house. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, I've said nothing on my notes, and that's okay. Now, now here's what's funny, and I, perhaps we'll share more in a, in a later time. But my, my wife and I were just blessed with a brand new house. Now, here's what's funny. <clears throat> so I got asked to speak. I was like, well, all right, the Lord was already dealing with me. I can't find none of my study books. I can't find them. I know they're in the house. So last night, I was going through some changes. Like, Lord, I really want to dive deeper into this stuff, and I don't know what my stuff is. I was like, well, I can't worry about it. So I did the best I could. I read my little word and got my little chapter up here. I got it all nice and pretty. Couldn't even print because I can't have my printer set up. So here's my work laptop sitting up here. I'm piecing stuff together. All right. And then he decides, you're not going to say that anyway. <laughs> but I want to talk a little bit about this mistreatment and abuse of authority figures. Now, here's what the Lord was bringing to me. And I've talked a little bit about it already. Here is some aspects. Well, let me go back. So the Lord was bringing to me the story of Jacob and Esau in the Bible, okay? Now, this was a disaster on wheels. You know, I like to break stuff down so it's plain. This was a disaster on wheels, all right? Rebecca and Isaac become pregnant with these twins, and God actually tells Rebecca, yeah, this is not going to go well. He actually tells Rebecca that, okay? So Esau is the oldest, Jacob's the youngest. And in that time, Esau is supposed to have dominion over the brethren, his brothers. He's the one in charge. He's the one that's supposed to get the blessing from the father. All these things are supposed to happen, all right? So Esau loses his mind one day when he comes in from hunting and decides that he's hungry. And Jacob, being the facetious person that he is, say, well, you give me your birthright, I'll give you some food. Evil, right? All right? But Esau does it. So he already lost half of his blessing before he got to the blessing. He was supposed to get double. So now we down to one, okay? Isaac becomes old and says, all right, I need to go ahead and pass on this blessing. I think my days are short. Now, let me, let me go back. So Rebecca and, and Isaac both had their favorites. I don't know, that might hit home to somebody. So Esau, Isaac's favorite, Jacob, Rebecca's favorite. But they weren't just favorites. Rebecca actually worked against Isaac because Jacob was the favorite of hers. She actually undermined his authority. So when we get to the time where the blessing is supposed to come, he, 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 she overhears Isaac tell Esau, go kill me some venison so that I can eat and pass on my blessing to you. And Rebecca says, oh, oh, I'm going to get this. So he tells Jacob, she tells Jacob, hey, go get this, go get this meat out the field. I'm going to cook it for you. I'm going to put some hair, some hair on you so you feel like Esau, so that Isaac thinks that it's Jacob. I'm sorry, switch. So Jacob thinks it's Esau. Isaac thinks Jacob is Esau. Got it. Thank you, all Y'all keep me straight. And so Jacob was kind of like, I don't know about this. Rebecca's like, obey me. So at that time, I was like, well, my parents told me to do this, so here I am going down. So he successfully fools Isaac into getting his blessing. 
and Esau returns. Now, this, this is where the Lord started dealing with me about his response, okay? So Esau returns, comes in with his men and says, hey, Dad, I got your, got your food like you want. And I was just like, what you mean? I, I just blessed you. What are you talking about? You didn't bless me. Oh, it must have been Jacob. What you mean it must have been Jacob? Because he understands he can't undo it. It's done. But look at Esau's response, okay? Let me find it here. He says, and he said, it's not he rightly named Jacob. Oh, I'm sorry. I am way ahead of myself. I'm Genesis 27. And I'm at 36. It says, and he said, it's not he rightly named Jacob, for he has supplanted me two times. Look what he brought up. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. And he said, Have, has not thou reserved a blessing for me? So his response wasn't, he took my blessing. His response first was, he already took my birthright. Meaning, really, in Esau's heart, he never dealt with the first issue. This is what happens to us. It starts compounding. So when things happen with people in authority, what does it do? You start talking about what so-and-so did. 20 years ago. Classic sign that I have an issue that I need to deal with. You can say, well, I'm just relating it to this. Well, why does it come up every time? Why is your reaction so over the top based on the situation? If my reaction doesn't meet the situation, that's what I got to turn over my plate and say, well, Lord, something wrong. Okay? So this is his response. All right, so he's saying, I've been got twice. So we go on, and, you know, Isaac's like, I'm sorry, man. The blessing's gone. Okay. Now, in verse 41, it says, Esau hated Jacob, hated Jacob, because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, in his heart, it never came out of his mouth. The days of mourning of my father are at hand. In other words, he's about to die. Then I'll slay my brother. No big deal. So it appears like Esau has it out for his brother, which he does. Because it, he didn't just steal his blessing. He stole his position. So when Esau should have been over the brethren... Now he has to come under under Jacob, and he's the younger one. You got to hear this. It's not just a blessing. He stole a position. Okay? Now, if you go over to 28, verse 8. All right, I'm kind of speeding through kind of fast. So it appears like he only has an issue with Jacob. But I'm going to show you something. Okay? Go down to verse 8. So now Jacob's been sent away because he knows his death, he might die if Esau really pulls the plug. So he's in hiding. All right? And in verse 8 it says, And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan please not Isaac his father, then went Esau unto Ishmael and took unto the wives which he had, Malath the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Navajah, to be his wife. So what did he just do? Esau overheard his father say, I don't really like the Canaanite woman. I really don't want my sons to marry her. What did he do? He went and did it. Because at the end of the day, he really still had an issue with his father. And because the anger that he had toward his father wasn't dealt with, it was birthed into rebellion. And this is why we got to deal with this stuff. Because it starts with a seed of anger. And as that anger stays there for years and years, it opens the door. So it's just like me sitting in my house. Days and days, doors unlocked, windows open. You can see I've got $20,000 worth of stuff sitting in there, and I do nothing about it. And then you see a person walking by every night. Hmm. 
Next night. Ooh. They don't look like they're there tonight. All right, third night. They're still looking at him. Oh, all right. You know what, boys? This might be a good one. And before you know it, what? They're trying to break into the house. But it didn't happen overnight. They scoped it out days before. This is what the enemy does to us when we don't deal with this stuff. So you walking in rebellion didn't just happen overnight. It happened over time because the anger was cemented in my heart. And then the enemy saw, oh, he's vulnerable. Oh, he's still festering. Ooh, he's still, ooh, I'm a, okay. I'm going to put this, this thought in his mind, and then he's going to walk right in. And those spirits attached to us. And then we can't figure out, why can I submit? Because I haven't dealt with the core of the issue. You don't just become that way. This is because of time and neglect of our hearts. And so he was bringing this to me, and I said, wow, um, all right. So he was dealing with me about that. And then he started talking about Cain and Abel. So, you know, in Cain and Abel's story, you know, uh, Cain, you know, got rejected by God because his offering wasn't pleasing to the Lord. Abel's uh, offering was pleasing to the Lord. Okay. So Cain slays his brother. But when Christ says where he is, what is his response? Why are you asking me? I ain't my brother's keeper. Interesting, right? So it appears like he had an issue with his brother, but guess who he really had an issue with? God himself. And because he had an issue with that, his response was such, because it's like, well, I mean, you need to take my offering, so why are you asking me for it? And he said, this is what's happening to some, some people in the body. So you're serving. You're bringing your offering to the Lord. And in the process, you're seeing others blessed. And so your response is automatically to God, well, Lord, I'm doing all this stuff. I don't see these promises that you keep saying that you're going to give me. So I guess my offering, my service is not good enough for you. And so I'm serving, but I'm mad. I'm serving, but I'm upset. If I get asked what something else to do, I'm upset. If pastor called me, asked me for something, I'm hot. Why? Because your issue is really with God. Because, see, God has the authority to render the blessing. And because he hasn't done it, I'm taking it out on. So this is how he was bringing it to me, is that these issues with either our father, our mother, or God himself is what's driving us. And it's causing us to walk into sin. Okay? Now, here's the four things he gave me. Five things. When we don't deal with issues with people in authority. That includes God. Including God. So I already mentioned rebellion. Rebellion also produces witchcraft. Witchcraft simply said is me trying to manipulate a situation. It ain't no voodoo, I did a spell, blah, blah, blah. It is me trying to manipulate a situation. So let me give you a real candid example. This is me showing up and pastor says, uh, I want you guys to fast for three days. Your first response, I ain't doing that. That's the rebellion. Your second response, you call someone, Man, that ain't necessary. Now you're in witchcraft. Because not only are you rebellion, now you manipulated someone else to rebel. That's how this works. So you need it. I feel, I feel like we think witchcraft is something way up here. It is simple as that. But remember, it wasn't dealt, it, it wasn't birth from him asking you to fast. It triggered something inside of you because he asked you to do something. So it means that somebody in your life asked you to do something and you were not happy with the results. So you decided everyone else was on the same level. 
okay? Second thing, semen and anger. Now, a pastor talked about this a few years ago. This is where daddy, mommy, whoever else as a child never did what they were asked to do for you. In other words, they didn't keep promises or they mistreated you or they abused their authority or they were mean to you or something along those lines. And we became mad about it. But then 20, 30, 40 years goes by and I don't realize that I'm really still mad under the surface. So a lot of times we say, I'm good. That was in my childhood. Ain't nothing going on. I'm fine. But why are you angry all the time? That is, that's not natural. Something wrong. So if, I, if I'm mad all the time, something's sitting under there, and it's nice and planted in, and it's dressed up with flowers on the top, and blah, blah, blah. This is just how weeds go. Weeds look pretty from the yard, from the driveway, till you get up on them. Then you realize they're killing everything else. That's how this works. Semen and anger. Third thing, pride. Pride. And you know what he said? He said, pride, a cover for fear of being treated as they were before. So this comes off as this. Oh, pastor said, I need to pray three hours a day. I don't need to do that. I'm spiritual enough. One hour is good. He says, Hey, uh, we're going to come to service 15 minutes earlier so that we can pray. I don't need to come there. I pray to the Lord all the time. I could just do it at my house. Pride. But really what it is is you're scared to submit. So what's happened is over time we have different reactions to it. We actually start walking in fear, but instead of showing that I'm scared, I'm just going to act like I know it all. I got this. I don't need them. I don't need this boss. I can do this however I want to do it. I know what I'm doing. Pride. But really what it is, deep down, you are terrified to submit again. Because someone in your life, when you submitted, took advantage of it. So you can only get to a certain point, and then you launch right into that mode. Bitter root judgments. And I said, I don't have time to even get into all this stuff. Bitter root judgments. So I joined three or four different churches. This one's going to be different. I know it. I can feel it in my spirit. It's going to be different. All right? But you still think about the first pastor who did A, B, and C. So even if he smells like he might say something, guess what? Spring right on up. And what you didn't want to happen ends up happening. This is what happens in relationships. Oh, Lord. Okay. Okay. Y'all, I hope y'all still like me after I get done. So, look. <clears throat> this is what happens in marriage, okay? All right. Daddy, and mom, daddy or mama, whichever. They abused their authority. They didn't treat you nice. Whatever happened, happened. Perhaps you were abused in some form or fashion. You become an adult, and you say, I found the one. He ain't nothing like my daddy. I'm good, man. Couple years go by, nothing happens. Everything seems great. But then, one day, one day, something happens. And a trigger, a switch flips. And you say, why am I feeling like this? And why are they acting like this? Because really, you made a vow which said, I will never submit myself to someone like him. And in the process of the vow, you actually produced what you didn't want. And this is when we start cycling. We keep thinking, oh, everything's good. This is the one. 10 years later, this is the one. 20 years later, oh, yeah, we good. This is the one. And then it's, it ends up not being the one. Because really, who's the factor in all of it? You are. I am. We cycle. Bitter root judgments. And then lastly, 
tainted view of God. Tainted view of God. So this is when, when we understand that we have to stay in the process, although we understand it, because we don't see God moving like we want, we automatically equate him to man. In other words, although I know he loves me, although I understand that he will come through for me, I just can't get past that he might just be like my brother, my sister, my dad, my uncle, or whoever. He may abandon me. So after a certain point, I can only wait for so long. And then I'm either leaving God or I'm going to take it in my own hands. Because I understand if I take care of it, then I know it will get done. But if I wait for God, he may just not come. Tainted view. Tainted view of God. And he said it prevents us from being obedient to God. And then it bursts into wounded will and disappointment with God. And I said, I don't have time to get into all of this, Okay. But tainted view of God. So for some of us, this is what's happening. Because Christ, God is an authority figure. We see him as an authority. But because we haven't dealt with the authority figures on the earth, we can't really relate to God as we should. All right. Last few things, and then I'm done. So there are many areas of mistreatment, but here's the ones that he gave me. First one, a critical authority figure. So someone always criticizing, never can do anything up to par, always the underdog. So we always feel like we were criticized. If I come to you as an adult and give a suggestion, what happens? My reaction is I'm mad. So I may not be trying to be offensive, but because the authority figure in my life was critical, I'm responding to you as you being critical, although I'm not being critical. All right. Second thing, not dependable, failed promises. And I kind of tapped into this already. A person in your life who was uh, a, a important part of your life gave promises and they never came through on them. Never came through. So then I walk and start walking with the Lord and some time passes. And what, what do I say? He ain't coming through. And I don't want to say that. Because I understand it's God, but because I haven't dealt with the issue with mama, daddy, or whoever, I'm automatically assuming he's not going to come through on his promise either. Third thing, took advantage of you. So this is a very broad statement, but let me give you just how he gave it to me. So take an advantage. So this could be an example of someone um, asking you to do your dad maybe asks you to do something, and then uh, they add 10 other things to it, and some of them he could have been doing. He's just sitting there on the chair doing nothing. And this happens multiple times. So guess what? I become an adult, and I get into my job, and they send me a memo to do something. What's my reaction? I ain't doing that. You ain't going to take advantage of me. I No, I'm leaving right here at 4 o'clock. I get off at 4 o'clock. You ain't going to do yep, 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 yep. You could have got it done in like a minute. Like it wasn't even that big of a deal. But because this mind is all messed up, you automatically assume that everybody is trying to take advantage of you. This makes it difficult when I try to serve in the, in the church because if an extra service is added, automatically assume, well, I'm being taken advantage of, so I just ain't going. What? What do you mean? Everybody has, to, everybody's going. Like, I don't, it's Sunday morning service. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't understand. But this is what happens to us. And then lastly, at a father or mother was absent. And I'm not just talking about absent from the home. I'm talking about absent from relationship. So your father or mother could be in the house and still absent. But because this authority figure was absent, you didn't get the affirmation you needed. You didn't get the support you needed. So then I become an adult. I join a body of Christ. I'm walking with the Lord. And all of these things come up. So I can't really serve without somebody affirming me every single time. And if I don't get the affirmation, then I just stop working. 
because really what I needed was the affirmation from my parents. So now I'm trying to get it from you. And if you don't deliver, I'm out. This is how these things work. So this is why these foxes have to be dealt with because we can't really align ourselves with God or leadership or our church or our, or our pastors or any of those things until we deal with these things. And so this is what the Lord gave. Like I said, I was like, wow, this is heavy stuff on a birthday? For real? I was like, well, maybe he'll give me some shop. Nope. I said, nope, that's all he gave me, so that's what you gave me. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. God is worthy of the praise. Hallelujah. I'm so excited because somebody's going to get free today. Somebody's going to get free today because the word brings what? Freedom. So I don't know I need help unless the Lord expose that I need help. So I know some of you, I know that some of you are angry with me right now. But if you're angry, just say, Lord, I'm mad with this guy, but I understand it's because the Lord wants to do something inside of me.